Hello. Welcome back. So again, this is an ongoing series on, we call Straight Talk on Collecting, and of course it's about collecting photography. Along with these little short videos, we have supplemental information on our website, which is photographydealers.com. And if you go to that website, under the History of Photography, you'll see about 25 other presentations of different types. There are some written, there are some PowerPoints, and this is our second attempt at video. We want to thank you for all the wonderful, really, comments that so many of you sent in. I want to remind you, these talks are not meant to be in-depth. They're cursory, introductory talks to various topics. Some people commented last week that I didn't go into enough depth. Others said it was a little too long. Um, I guess the goal on these videos is 20 minutes, but I think I'm going to have to try to just talk faster, because I'm not sure I could get to 20 minutes, but I will try to talk a little quicker if I could. Uh, we thank you for joining us, and today's topic we're calling um, Cameras and Format. And when we use the word format in photography, we're referring to the size of the negative and what kind of prints we can produce from those negatives. So I begin by introducing you, this is an 8x10 camera. And a lot of the masterworks of the 20th century were done with a camera like this. The advantages of using a large 8x10 view camera like this is for one, you'll notice the lens plane and the back, everything's movable. Side to side, swings or tilts. That lets us control perspective. I think many of you know, kind of, if you've ever ta taken a photograph looking up at uh, tall trees or a tall building, we get this kind of uh, foreshortening or this convergence. What this lets us do is to keep things perfectly straight, uh, vertically or horizontally, or we can exaggerate those lines and do something to our own liking. So because we have the ability to control vertical and horizontal lines, we can make the photograph to our liking, more interpretive, if you will. The other strength, really, and some people don't realize it's a strength, is that in using a view camera, we're taking one picture at a time. Not a roll of film, not hundreds of pictures. And because we're taking one at a time, we're able to take many light readings. You might have heard of Ansel Adams' system of exposure and development called the zone system. Those photographers that prescribe to that technique literally are able to turn black things white and white things black. And it's an intense coordination between exposure and development. The way this camera works is we, in the darkroom, we put film into a film holder. Of course, I'm ruining this piece of film just to show you. There's a piece of film here. So this is done in the darkroom. Then this film holder is slid into the camera. We pull the slide. We pull the slide, take a picture, and then we go back to our darkroom and develop that photograph. And we end up with an 8x10 negative. So this is the size of the negative. I mentioned last week, and we'll talk more about this today, is there's two kinds of photographic prints, basically. Of course, there's more types. But one we call a contact print. And a contact print is a print that's made exactly from the negative. This is done in the darkroom. A piece of photographic paper is placed down. The negative is placed on top of it. We turn on a light. The light passes through the negative onto the photographic paper, and the photographic paper is developed, and we have our contact print. In analog photography, these contact prints are prized. They are the sharpest, clearest rendition of our photographic negative. The other possibility, of course, is making an enlargement. So this is an enlargement made from this same size negative. So the photographer does have options 
especially with view camera photography. But again, in the, in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, an 8x10 enlarger, an, an enlar piece of equipment that can enlarge a negative this size, was kind of a prized piece of equipment. So for the most part, we look at these contact prints, which are really exquisite. This is by Elliot Porter. It's called White Boulder in Black Place. A few other uh, Elliot Porter 8x10 contact prints. And actually I should add, this camera, this 8x10 that I'm showing you, this was Elliot Porter's camera. He gifted it to Janet and I. Um, I think many of you know Janet was Elliot's assistant. So this camera actually produced these first few pictures that I'll be showing you. This is a portrait of Georgia O'Keeffe. This was done in 1945, and she was sitting for the artist Mary Callery, who was producing this bust. And this is one of Elliot's favorite photographs in black and white. This is up by the confluence of the Chama River. This image hung over Elliot's desk in his studio. And it was taken uh, outside of Abiquiu, New Mexico, where Georgia O'Keeffe lived by Ghost Ranch. And it's really, a, a, still to this day, it's a place we can go and, and, and capture this beautiful view. So, format refers to the size of the negative. Other cameras produce negatives of different sizes. This is a 4x5 camera. A 4x5 camera works in much the same way as the 8x10. It has a smaller film holder, of course, and these are loaded. They are placed inside the camera and exposed and developed. But again, I can't tell you the power that we have in being able to do one photograph at a time, have total control over this perspective of our scene, be able to to literally interpret the scene tonally the way we prefer in terms of blacks, grays, and whites. And we were able to compose on what we call a ground glass. And the ground glass is the back of the camera. So when the lens is open and the image is projected onto here, we're able to compose tilting the camera vertical, we could shoot vertical, we could shoot horizontal. We really have an amazing amount of control over our scene. This is a 4x5 negative. I think many of you can see that. And again, 4x5 also is conducive to contact printing. Where able to make a print of a decent exhibitable size. This is one of Janet's photographs of um, Elliot and Aline's home on their island, Great Spruce Head Island in Maine. This is another 4x5 contact print of Janet's that was done in Black Block Island, in Rhode Island. And you can see, although the negative is considerably smaller than the 8x10, we can make a print that has a size that can comfortably be viewed, and again, the exquisite quality is, is really unrivaled. This is a photograph by Nancy Newhall. This was taken at Black Mountain College. This is literally the moment that Buckminster Fuller is calculating the mathematics behind the geodesic dome. And these are the hands of Buckminster Fuller working on his um, maquette, if you will, of a geodesic dome. This is another Nancy Newhall of Ansel Adams done at Dante's view in Death Valley. So the contact print is an aesthetic in its own right. I mean it really is uh, something that a lot of collectors prize so in a way, the, the grail of 4x5 contact prints might be considered from the Alfred Stieglitz series equivalents, which I did a whole newsletter about a few weeks ago, but there's a few hundred photographs of clouds that Alfred Stieglitz felt 
and verbalized that these images are equivalent to his emotional feeling at the time that he pressed the shutter. And in a way, that statement brings us to the beginning of abstraction in photography, because these are truly interpretive photographs where the image itself is representative of an emotional feeling. And this, again, I will put a still of this on, on our supplemental information on our website, because I would imagine it's very hard to see on this video. Other formats, this is a, what we call a two and a quarter camera. It's a twin lens camera. We look in it, the top lens is what we're looking through. The bottom lens is actually taking the photograph. This is a camera that's typically used like this, but it's kind of nice because you could also use it like this and shoot over a crowd, or you could shoot sideways, but typically you'll see a photographer like this. The size of the negative, is two and a quarter by two and a quarter. That's two inches and one quarter inch and by two. So it's a square negative. Square is a difficult format to work in. I know a lot of you are familiar with it because you've, you've seen the work of Diane Arbus. So Diane Arbus maybe single-handedly made some of, made this kind of the square popular. Um, in her photograph, and I've talked about this previously, you can actually see the whole negative, and that's what this black line around the image represents. So being able to work square is also a little less confrontational because you're holding the camera here, you know, as opposed to, you know, putting a camera in someone's face. And I think there are advantages, especially if you work with people, to be able to relax people and you get a little less intrusive when you're working, you know, from your, your chest or your waist. 35 millimeter, probably you're most familiar with. This is a 35 millimeter camera. This is actually the camera I use when I photograph a 35 millimeter. Hard to take the lens cap off with my gloves on. This produces a negative It's this size, one by one and a half, very tiny. So now that we're talking about two and a quarter and 35 millimeter, the notion of a contact print really isn't practical. That's not to say no one did it. Walker Evans did a beautiful series of the Brooklyn Bridge making 35 millimeter contact prints. They were literally this big, but not many people could get away with that. So once we're moving to these smaller formats, we are enlarging our negative, like in the case of the Diane Abbas I just showed you. Or, let's take for example this Beaumont Newhall photograph of Chase National Bank, done in 1929. This too was shot with a two and a quarter camera. What I'm showing you I like about these, this is another Beaumont Newhall photograph. This is Edward Weston looking out of his dark room, done in Carmel in 1940. This is done with a four by five. So Beaumont used two and a quarter, he used four by five, and this is a portrait of Henri Cartier-Bresson, which was done in 35 millimeters. But it wasn't done with this camera, this 35mm camera. It was done with this 35mm camera. And this is kind of the Rolls Royce of 35mm. This is called the Leica. There's so much to know about the Leica and the Leica company itself. And I encourage you to kind of Google this company and, and learn a lot about their role in Europe during the war years. But this camera is really a piece of handmade machinery. It's, it's just a pretty quiet, it's small, it's light, it's quick. And with this kind of camera, you're able to do more spontaneous photography. And when we think of the Leica, we think of the photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson. And Henri Cartier-Bresson, is a photographer that kind of elevated 
the small camera into a, a tool for an artist. Some people look down on 35 millimeter photography thinking if you were a serious photographer you had to use a big camera because this was looked was more professional, was capable of a different sense of quality. But you can't imagine taking an 8x10 or 4x5 into the street. Some people do. I'm not saying it's not possible. But to do the work that Cartier-Bresson did, quick, 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 you need something like this. You need to be kind of unobtrusive, you need to be able to walk, and you probably know Henri Cartier-Bresson was known for this term, the decisive moment. Being able to capture things at the moment of their happening, or what we say is the vortex of the action. Some people misunderstand this notion of the decisive moment. Some people think that to photograph in this vein you have to be like super fast. The truth is, those of you who are photographers know, if you see something happening and then pick up your camera to take that picture, it probably already happened. It probably is already gone. So when we think of the decisive moment, we think of the genius of Bresson who actually saw the potential for imagery to happen. He was at the ready before that action happened. So when he saw everything come into place, that's when he took his photograph. So it takes some thinking, it takes some vision. Each of these cameras have a, a look, have a kind of a look. We contact prints, enlargements, they have different shapes, they're made of different sizes. I want to bring us back for a minute to this notion of 8x10 because it would be <clears throat> improper to not celebrate the work of the photographer Edward Weston whose really 8x10 contact prints are maybe some of the most beautiful. I'm going to start by showing you this Beaumont Newhall photograph and remind you that it's not the equipment, it's not the brand, it's not the, you know, how much money you have or, or the resources, it's, it's this equipment. This is a photograph that Beaumont made in 1940 of Edward Weston's darkroom. It was total bare bones. It had a sink, he had a graduate, he had three trays, and he had a light bulb. And with that light bulb and those three trays, he made some of the most beautiful contact prints that we have in our history of photography. This is an Edward Weston photograph of his son, um, Neil, I believe. And uh, those of you who are not familiar with his work, I would encourage you to look at it. Or again, we've used his work many times in our newsletters over the weeks. I also want to show you or introduce you to one other photographer. This photographer is named Willard Van Dyke, who is really one of the founders of what we might call the straight photography movement. He was instrumental in bringing together a group of like-minded photographers to begin a group called Group F64, which is actually the name of an aperture on the lenses of large cameras. And through that aperture, we can take super sharp photographs. So, again, you know, there's some of you might think this is kind of old fashioned photography, but I assure you that many photographers are still working with analog equipment. Of course, now we have the ability to do things in photography that really couldn't have been done previously before the invention of digital photography. This is a digital camera kind of interesting. This is the present or the future and this is the past. With this camera we're able to make photographs in sizes, in ways that we were never able to produce before. There are still many reasons if you work in black and white to work in analog. I do, but I think a lot of people who especially work in color it almost um, doesn't make sense at this point because the power of the digital technologies in color photography are kind of unrivaled. I show you that 
Let me pass these over. There's no loss of quality. I think I said this last week. In digital, there's no loss of quality because we're not dealing with, with particles of silver to form our image. And I, again, I don't want to get crazy technical on you. We're now dealing with what we call pixels. And because we could work on those pixels in various programs like Photoshop or Lightroom, we're really able to redefine quality in photography. I mean, this is a little 8x10 work print that I um, made just part of my hip-hop series of uh, turntables. This is a digital enlargement. And I tell you, there's no difference in quality. I could make this twice this size and it would still hold up. It's kind of amazing what we're able to do digitally. The other thing about digital, as I said, 8x10, we take one picture at a time. 4x5, we take one picture at a time. Two and a quarter, we can take 12 pictures at a time. 36 pictures at a time. This is a roll of two and a quarter film. 12 pictures. This is a roll of 35 millimeter film. 36 pictures. This is a digital card for this digital camera. Depending on the quality that I set this camera at, I could take close to 500 pictures or 4,000 pictures on this card. So think of it. Think of someone like William Henry Jackson who would take a camera three times this size out to photograph in the Rocky Mountains with mules filled with glass plates and equipment and tripods and cameras. Think of one of those mules tripping and he'd lose six months work. And now think of what a photographer could do by taking this little card and this. So there's no denying the power and the abilities that we have working digitally. But for you as collectors or potential collectors, I want you to understand that when you see a photograph on the wall, by understanding you know, what went into the creation of that image, of course it's all about the image, it's all about what we're looking at. But to understand how the photographer worked, what the photographer's abilities were, that kind of all goes into this big pot and we might call appreciation and understanding. So I'm going to be putting uh, some stills, some other supplemental information on um, this video, but again, you'll have to access our website to read some of the and view some of the images that I showed you today. I'll also probably put a few handouts in a PDF format that you could print out. I do want to say one of the great emails we received this week, I was not familiar, but in a remarkable resource at RIT, which is the Rochester Institute of Technology, on print identification. Um, someone there sent us a link, and for those of you especially who commented that you wanted more depth in last week's presentation about process, I'm going to include the information on accessing this database, which I think you're going to find a remarkable resource. I'm also going to put some information about what we call conservation preservation, but something about the archival qualities of these various prints. Black and white prints versus color prints versus dye transfer prints versus digital prints. So you could learn a little more about the storing and the caring for these prints, although we will be doing a video just on that. So thank you for joining us today. Please access Photography Dealers, dealers PhotographyDealers.com and we really appreciate you sending in your comments. We're, we listen, we're trying to make adjustments, and I don't know how long this one is, but I don't think I did it in 20 or 30 minutes, but I'll continue to try to learn to talk faster and do less. So please stay safe. There's still time to vote. Please vote. Thank you.